Wagwan, everybody. Welcome to the Dis Afimi History Podcast, where we'll be speaking about history and as well family history and how history relates in terms of Caribbean people um, for the present as well as in the past and how in the past what that does and brings forth for what we are going through at present and what we can learn from our history from our family and take that moving forward so I do hope you enjoy the podcast and if you like it please ensure to subscribe like and review thank you in today's episode featuring Kofi PCE who is an author blogger writer and podcaster and publisher. With your host, Wendy Aris, and in the discussion, we'll be diving into the blog post of Beautiful African Hair. Please stop using the other N-word. So let's have a listen. Thank you so much, uh, Kofi Pige, for coming on to the podcast, Dis After Me History, and to discuss your blog post, Beautiful African Hair, Please Stop Using the Other N-Word. So before we start, I'll just have you introduce yourself to the audience. Okay. Um, my name is, as, as she said, is Kofi Piche. Uh, I am an author, um, a ghostwriter, a writer, a publisher, uh, independent um, research, and belong to various research groups such as Masawari Clan, Kofi Piche Research Team, and a group that's called the Session Matter Nature, where we specialize in what y'all call the hieroglyph, but we they the uh, remitch call them the metro Um I'm a, and a podcaster. Um that's me in a nutshell. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. And I'll make sure to include those uh in the show notes for if people want to further delve into what you are working on at this time. So we'll start with again, I always ask um individuals that come on as to what was their why? Why did you want to explore this topic from this different lens? Well, I'm I, like I said, I, I specialize in uh, West African culture, but in African culture in general, and the um, the hair aspect. That was one aspect that I had never been uh, really touched into. I touched in all the other cultural uh, uh, and, and traditional uh, uh, things in Africa, whether it's Central Africa, West Africa, uh, North Africa, and so forth, but also me hearing the word, uh, the N-word a lot, the word nappy, right? So um, me hearing that word a lot and us using, and and I'm guilty of that, me using that word as a young boy. Um, I talk about that in my book as well with my my, my cousin that I grew up with, but just hearing the, the N-word and us devaluing ourselves when it comes to our skin skin tone and our and our hair. So, you know, it prompted me to say, okay, well, let me virtue further into this and see why we, you know, heavily hate ourselves when it comes to our hair and our skin. Because anytime we talk about our hair, it's always in a der derogatory manner. And I know our ancestors uh centuries ago. I know they had no no uh, uh no concept of what nappy were or you know they 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 had to love their hair plus the misconception of me growing up um there's always been a bad image of our people on uh, and, and on on the continent you know far as pop bellies dark skin you know hair all over the place so um I just wanted to research that a little bit further and 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 and, and go in details behind it because as I looked and studied certain traditions there were certain things that I seen ritualistic that they was doing so you know that sparked me to, to you know dive deep into it you know because I knew it it, it it had more than more than um what we think also here in in America styling like our women here with their hair like they spend thousands of dollars on their hair i mean wigs hundreds of dollars on their hair you know every week getting their hair done so i mean so it, it so i knew it was more than just looking good also right so no definitely it's it's um you know this hair industry for uh people of african descent is a billion dollar industry and of yeah. course what you said in terms of this other n-word the nappy Mm -hmm. It's not used in a very positive frame, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate 
to when they're getting their hair combed as a young child. And if your hair was, you know, tough and nappy, it wasn't said in the most endearing for, or as a compliment. So, you know, in terms of with discussing, would you discuss the uh, this other word, of course, nappy, and why it was used? Well, you know, uh, uh, again, um, going to slavery, like my book is called Africa's Hair Doing Before and After Slavery. So I talk about before, doing, and after slavery. So let's just talk about doing slavery for a minute. During slavery, uh, um, you know, the N word, this word was used as other words was used to to dehumanize um, um, African people. Um, prior to the Atlantic slave trade, if we look at um, certain areas uh, that the European came into uh, the interior of Africa, whether we look at Central Africa first and then we look at West Africa, let's look at Central Africa. Um, I can't think of the Frenchman name, Peter, I can't pronounce his last name, but um, he put a book out and he, as they was trading, and you know, other Europeans were trading, they looked and they seen how um these different ethnic groups in Africa was prideful in their hair and the different unique styles that they had. So they knew they took pride in their appearance and they took pride, you know, in 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 the in, in their hair. So this Frenchman wrote about um, you know, wrote about these these people he encountered who had prideful in their hair. And not even when you go to West Africa, it was the same thing as far as with the trading. They seen the same thing, right? So once the Atlantic slave trade actually jumped off, um, they began to dehumanize these people. They want to, we, we know once we was, our ancestors were kidnapped, right? They were stripped of a thorough knowledge of who themselves, right? So, um, you know, so hair, was also another thing. Skin was also another thing. So they do dehumanize them again to use this word nappy because they started to res started to say that our ancestors were animals, right? So the word nappy uh, is is a derogatory term, and and through slavery, um, we not only were fi uh, physically abused, but we were psychologically abused. Yeah. So it left these psychological scars when it comes to our skin tone. In our hair, our hair color. So we begin to use this word nappy, 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 which is a derogatory term, which means woolly, which mm -hmm. means kinky. And 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 through um, early writings, you will hear the word not only nappy as they describing our hair as animals or sheep like, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they use uh, 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 peppercorn, you know, tight roll, knotted, 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 knotted hair, right? So this term has always been a negative the negative term when it comes to describing us, right? They were always, like I said, describe us in that manner, you know, uh, um, being derogatory. And through the years, we have uh, taken on that, you know, because like I said, we have been psychologically scarred. So now, as they describe ourselves, we believe that that's what we look like. That's what our hair looks like. That's what we look like. You know, which goes back to what you talk about the billion dollar company. I talked about that also in my book, my last chapter. I give graphs and and stats and statistics to talk about those things. Um, you know, us being psychological scar and us believing in what those people have said about us, and it's still been passed down. We're four hundred and some years removed from slavery, but we still have those psychological scars where we believe that we are ugly. Like, I'm dark. I'm a dark skinned man. So we've been believed that dark skin is ugly. Right. We've been believed that hair is, is ugly. Even when we look at in the early 60s, I can't think of the psychologist, but the uh, psychologist in the early 60s, he did a study on imagery. Right. With girls between the age of five to 11 or 12 years old when he had black and white. So when he would ask the young African-American girl uh, or the black girl or African descent girl, what girl is pretty? She he asked the European girl that as well. They were pointing at the white girl. He had a black and a white girl. So when he would ask the 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 white girl and the black girl which girl has the uh, a good hair, they were pointing at the white girl. When they asked which girl has the bad hair, the white and the black girl will point at the black girl. They will ask 
which girl or which uh, doll is ugly, they will point at the black girl. When they mm -hmm. will ask which girl hair is, you know, is 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 evil, they will point at the black girl. Which so it's been psychological scarred, you know. These things I just and and it's crazy. I just had a discussion with someone uh yesterday. Um, a um, a young lady was um actually FaceTiming her daughter, and her daughter was playing with a white doll. So I asked her, why are why your young daughter does not have a a a a doll that resembles her, right? You know, and she said it doesn't matter, and I said yes, it does matter, right? You know, because now you're teaching her early that you know beauty comes of the beauty standard. She has to measure the beauty standard by this uh, European doll that has this blonde, straight, you know, straight hair. So, um, yes, I hope that answers your question. I kind of went over the table. No, 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 absolutely no. I agree with all what you're saying, Coffee, because I mean, I know you said a lot there in terms of especially with skin color, but definitely with hair and that connection to as if we were animals. Mm -hmm. because as you know in the slave um you know some of the slave laws if we, we weren't even seen as people we were seen as chattel property right so mm -hmm. the fact that this too was used as a domination to totally have us disconnected from our history from our past it has mm -hmm. been very effective even up to today unfortunately so mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a lot so Hair, you know, as of course, as the significance in some African societies, would you be able to walk us through as to what some of the styles is? And I'll just bring up some of um, what we have here. Okay. And then you can uh, talk to what we can see. And let me just share. It has uh, a lot of significance. And I'll talk about this image in particular that you have up here in just a second. But hair has so many different uh, significance, you know, there's different hairstyles that represent, you know, uh, numerous things, um, and I and 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 you know, and and that is, you can identify another like if you look at the Sudan people in uh, East Africa, um, uh, the Nuba people. The Nuba people have fifty ethnic groups inside of those, right? Fifty ethnic groups. So to identify those fifty different ethnic groups within this one Nuba society. They, you can identify an uh, ethnic group by a certain hairstyle. Um, royalty, royalty, you can identify royalty by a certain hairstyle. Um, one who is not married, you can identify them as um, not married. One who uh, is an, an adult, you can identify them by a hairstyle. One who is an uh, adolescent, you can identify one who has just went through rites of passages. A priest, you can identify this image in particular right here is the Himba people that you have up here. They are from uh, Nuba, uh, uh, Nubia, which is in South Africa. And this hairstyle, um, you have the hairstyle on the left and the hairstyle on the right. On the right. This particular hairstyle on the left, um, I actually showed, I think, probably further down or before, those people who study uh, Kemet, or what y'all may refer to as Egypt today, right, this lock will be considered by Egyptologists uh, a Haru lock, right? And this Haru lock will also represents the era of Wusir or Usir, right? Or the uh, Nusab Nusabiti, which is the king's son. So, but in the Himba culture right here, uh, it represents uh, an adolescent boy, a young, a young man. The same thing with this humble boy with his plaque braided to the back. This was represent that he's young. He's not an adult yet. Because in African culture and African society, um, like I said, there's different hairstyles that resemble adults. And what's the name? So these young boys have not went through their rites of passage yet. The rites of passage are the, uh, of the, the adult rites of passage. So each in each culture in Africa, one must go through some type of rites of passage before they are able to be recognized as an adult in their culture or in this, as an adult in their society. So if we were to go and visit or we were to uh, uh, acclimate ourselves into this society, we would know that these two young men that we encounter is not even recognized as an adult in their society or so they would be young. We would know them as young men and not young adults yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then 
Just these two here. Yeah. Same thing. These these are older adult. These are also men of the Himba tribe, right? So once uh one becomes an adult and gets married, he has he has his hair is not braided anymore. His hair is unbraided, and they wear these certain caps on their head. And um, this brother at the bottom that you see with his hair is unkept, right? Um, unkept hair means so many different things, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, when we yeah. talk about the ritualistic, you know, certain things, the traditions when it comes to hair. Um, well, we can touch on it now because this picture right here is this guy here is in mourning. So, okay. so he's in mourning. So up under the cap, this is the only time that he removes his cap. And then we're, we're, we're referring to the, the Himbo man in the, in, in the Himbo culture. This is the only time that he will remove his, his headwear as in a, a, uh, in a stage of mourning. He has lost someone in his family. So this is why his hair is unexposed and it is unkept. But we'll talk a little bit more about unkept hair when we get a little bit further into the interview. But but that's why the guy hair is unkept right there at the bottom. Okay, and then just this last one here. Okay, this last one is the Basara. This is uh the uh this is in Chad, uh image of uh, women in Chad, right? And I wanted this picture to be up because there are so many myths when it comes to natural hair, right? We I don't heard it all, you know, about hair is is uh, our hair is bad, uh, natural hair is unkept, natural hair is dirty, natural hair can't be, you know, you can't grow natural hair. You have to put these chemicals and and so forth into your hair in order for uh, something into your hair to grow. You can't natural hair can't grow. So I wanted to show an image, but in my book I show further images and go in detail about these women that's in Chad and the process that they use in order to make their hair grow, right? So, and the natural remedies from uh, uh, um, the natural resources that grows in the ground, like this image, they use something called Chiba, a uh, Chiba powder. And Chiba powder, you can see Chiba powder. If I guarantee you 95, 90 to 95% of the hair growth things that are on the shelf when you look at the ingredients, the ingredients have Chiba powder in it. Just look it up. Okay. Majority of things, I'm not saying all, but majority of the hair growth things that they have in the hair industry, it has Chiba powder in it. Okay. So in the mountains, in Chad, they had this particular flower that has a flower blood on it. And this fly, they would take this flower board, this bud from off of this flower and uh, 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 these buds, and then they will take them and they will boil them. I, t I go in depth about that also in my book where they would take them. And I show you actually images of them actually taking them and putting them in a tray, putting water and actually boiling them and putting all and other different things in them to actually turn them into this type of and grind them up to turn them into this type of powder and put, you know, certain palm oils and stuff on it. And then they would take it a whole day. They would take this process and they would groove it into these women hair. This was a, a ritual that they were actually doing with their hair to actually groom it into their scalp and into their hair. Then they would take it and braid them into these long, these long braids um, uh, into their hair. So I wanted to show that, you know, hey, natural hair can, can, can be grown. There are certain things that they use within nature in order to make their hair grow long so i wanted to dispel one of those myths that na you na you can't grow natural hair natural hair you can't grow it long so that just another uh misnomer right yeah definitely no thanks uh for 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 indicating that because yes that is definitely something that and again i guess going on to you know what did the the type of hairstyle would indicate to the greater world of that person and or their status i know you mentioned some of it but if you can just go into greater detail now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, like you sure you want me to talk about a lot of the ritualistic yes. stuff when it comes yes. to hair? Okay, so let's go back to the unkept hair. So you will see in uh, 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 Nigeria, if you look at the Yoruba people, uh, you go to uh, Ghana, um, as well as Madagascar, these practices of unkept hair, those who... Um, lost a family member or someone that was close to them, um, they would use unkept hair. Like in certain women, this unkept hair would be for uh, a morning stages and also to like in uh, Ghana, 
this particular unkept power was to repel other men away from them to also let them in mourning. So it was because, see, we have been taught that um, um, our brothers and sisters on the continent that, you know, again, that their hair was bad, the hair was dirty, and it was a misconception that we didn't comb our hair, you know. So, and also in my book, I show and demonstrate a lot of images of them actually combing their hair. Hair was actually, and still is today, is actually... Uh, a, a place to go and socialize with and gather to gather to gather with. So they took pride in combing their hair. They took pride in combing their hair and you see it with the different styles, right? So the unkept hair was to, sh to show that this woman or this man was in mourning or to repel other men away from them if they, even if I had to stumble upon the woman I wouldn't find that woman attractive in my if in this particular culture, even if I didn't know she was in mourning because her hair was unkept. But also, um, I would probably be careful because also in other African cultures, um, unkept hair would also means that this this person may be unstable, may have mm -hmm. some types of bad behavior because again, in African culture, or uh, what people may consider, I don't like to use the word African spirituality. Yes. I don't like to use the word African tradition or religion, even though some people do, and even some of my uh, my counterparts and my research team use those words. Um, I have a book called Beautiful Lessons about Kimoyo, so I don't use the word those words because they don't have agency. So we're trying to push the word Kimoyo, which comes out of uh, comes out of the Congo, comes out of Central Africa, and this word describes the culture better, and we have. Uh, um, agency over the, over the word because when you go look at these words that we utilize in those words we don't have agency over those words because we didn't create those words even though some of our, our ancestors that have passed they have took this word on when you go look up John uh, Mbiti um, he's from um, um, he's from out of uh, Kenya uh, or you go look at uh, Odulawa who's out of Nigeria these two individuals help coin and push the word African tradition or religion. So a lot of our people uh, on uh, uh, in America, a lot of our people in the Caribbean and certain islands, a lot of people that are, um, uh, um, that are in Africa use these terms, but these terms does not come um, um, from us. So I don't like to use those terms, but also when also in, in, in mourning, shaving the hair. And certain cultures also, um, you will see if you go to um, Senegal, if you look at Senegal, you look at Gambia, um, uh, and those areas in West Africa, you will see, um, and even um, uh, um, East Africa, uh, mm -hmm. in certain cultures, you will see the shaving of the hair. Yes. So this was also another ritual that they would do within mourning. So they would shave the hair off. And this would that would also let you know that okay, there uh, a person is in mourning. But also, you they in certain cultures, um, you will see not only the shaving of the hair, but they will shave if there's hair on, on the body anywhere. They will completely shave their hair completely. This will also let you know that they are in a stage of mourning. But also, when you look at shaving of the hair, there was also a tradition and a ritual that took place where shaving of the hair. When we go to the rites of passages, the uh, uh, the first rite is the naming rite, right? So we know in African culture, um, women are named uh, um, um, later, men are, are named first. Sometimes in most cultures, you will see the woman named first and then the men named. So, and this is nine to, to 12 to 13 days later you know, mm -hmm. that they give the name. And this, this name is also not only given by the family, but some by the community as well. And we know that our ancestors had multiple names. And I have friends on the continent today have multiple names. When they say their name, I mean, they'll go for at least two minutes, mm -hmm. you know, talking about their names, right? And so in the name and rights of passages, the child, once the community comes together doing the name and ceremony in the rites of passages, they will shave the head if the baby has a hair on the head, will shave the hair completely, right? Because we believe that the ancestor is coming back. So the ancestor is leaving from the spiritual realm 
um, and, and, and to the, the physical. So now we're creating a pathway by shaving the child head. So now that spirit can enter in, you know, by the shaving of the head. And the same thing doing the funeral rites. Like that's mm -hmm. also another part of the rites of passage, the funeral rite. So now when the funeral rite, one head has to be shaved, right? So to open up a passage back to the, from the physical back into the spiritual world. So you will see those things as well. But also if you look at a depiction of African culture and African art, I also talk about that. I know I keep saying mm -hmm. my book, um, Africa's Hair. But I show you a lot of pictures in my book of depictions. But you can see this all over Africa where in their arts and their drawings where the heads are big, right? Because they believe that the head is the center point uh, of the body, right? The head is the most important or the most essential key to the body, right? Yeah. And the hair sits on top of this most important or essential part of the body. So they also believe in certain cultures that the hair was antennas or the hair was the connection to the divine, right? So this, so that was another thing, you know, of 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 the the, the importance of having hair was it was an extension to the divine. We we could communicate to divine because this head was the most essential part of which it is, mm -hmm. you know, the most essential part. So you will see the depiction of the head being bigger than bigger than the body because they they felt like that the head was the most important part as well as the hair was the most important part because it sits on the highest part of the important key of the uh of the uh, of the body you will also see like in um um royal statuses you will see like these big gigantic hairstyles and a lot of these gigantic elaborate hairstyles i would know that this woman or this man here um He's he's connected some type of royal status because of these certain different hairstyles, mm -hmm. um, these high hairstyles um, that they wear. And some of these hairstyles that we see, we're actually wearing some of these hairstyles today. We think some of these hairstyles today is um, is, uh, <laughs> is is a new phenomenon, you know, but it's not. You know, even when it comes to dyeing our hair, you know, <laughs> it's not a new phenomenon. You know, when you look at um. The Maasai people in um, uh, East Africa, the Maasai people, they they're all they they had a ritual for us with their warriors. I would we would know I would know if I was in that area. I'm encountering a Maasai warrior because of the red. This hair is completely red and it's braided, right? So what I would distinguish in the these people that this guy here. It is a warrior because he wore a certain thin types of braids in their hair. This was a and it was a ritual for them to take this red clay, this red ochre, right, and butter and mix it and dye their hair from the roots all the way back. So that was another thing. So dyeing is not a new phenomenon, but you see red ochre in every culture on the continent of Africa. If their hair had some type of redness in it, it was that red clay, that red orchid that they would use because you see that in East Africa. But if I take you down to, um, if I take you into Sudan, or uh, um, you will see that amongst other people too. Uh, you, if I, uh, um, you, I take you and you look at the Hamra people, the Hamra people the same way in the Sudan, you will see their hair is, it has this red texture. So we think a lot of braids, we think braids, um, is a new phenomenon. So all, all these things is something that we've been doing forever. And like I'm saying, like you said earlier, we do things and don't know why we're doing some of these things, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's, in, it's, in, it's just been embedded in us. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, what you're mentioning is just leading into the next uh, question here, because in spite of you know the horrors of slavery, uh, the enslaved Africans, you mentioned a couple of the stuff that was still passed on. Uh, part mm -hmm. of the ancestral memories of hair. Mm -hmm. Is there any other examples that you wanted to to speak with or speak on to, to this? About the, about the ancestral, I mean, about, about the hair? Yeah, what, what was done in the past, which is actually happening now. Did you mention oh, yeah. the dying of the hair? Yeah, like, like is there anything the dying else? of the hair, like braids. But let, let, let me talk about the braids because yes. when you start 
um and and we'll talk about locks i want to talk about rock yes. locks Bray. so but 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 i want to um people when you start doing research and 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 doing slavery like be prior before slavery there were always there were they they braided their hair there that was also a hairstyle and i re, i show that prior via the atlantic slave trade but mm -hmm. once we get to the slave trade those styles that we used the braid the braid our hair we took some of those things into on those plantations mm -hmm. but doing on the plantation braids begin to get a bad name so when so when you start looking in the early maybe the early 30s always to the early 60s um you start to see braids become a, a factor uh, where it, it's attached to slavery right we we know it's it's now it's it, it has come back onto the scene but prior to that a lot of people wouldn't resort to getting their hair braided because they resorted to to that but you have to understand they utilize braiding the hair in, 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 in as as uh, a style that you will most popularly see is because there we we had no tools like in my book I talk about the invention of the comb the comb was created 5000 years ago so I talk about in the areas that they they say that the cones may the uh the areas that the cone may be invented. Kemet is one particular place where I show you primary cones, but I also show you primary cones throughout the book of certain cones that we use. So we invented these things to comb our hair. So when we in we're now that we're in captive, there's no we don't we don't, we have less resources to do anything with. So we couldn't comb my hair. So braiding the hair was a technique and a style that was used, you know, and was easy. Braid mm -hmm. your hair. We can keep my hair up for two or three weeks and we can go on because and yeah. and, and because prior to me being in being captured, I come from a culture where combing the hair was a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Styling the hair was a normal thing. This were things that we did, right? We yeah. would these were things that we would we would get up. And like I said, this was also like a a um a, a, a thing where we can get out and go socialize with, yes. right? So and they seen these things too, where every day these people would get up, wash their hair, comb their hair, style their hair, and socialize while they doing these things, while they doing these things, right? So that also kills the, the 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 theme of African hair or our ancestors' hair being dirty. Our yeah. hair is being unkept. So this was a normal thing. So they go from this to this extreme where we have nothing. We have we don't have anything to put in our hair. Like exactly. certain things that you start to see, like um, straighten the hair. Like even let's go back. We'll let's go back to the the uh himba pre not the, the Maasai people for a mm -hmm. minute we talk about the braiding of the hair they would use certain things from the flower fluids in order to straighten their hair before they would braid their hair so they would use they would use cow urine they would use flower uh, uh, uh stuff from the flowers liquid from the flowers they would use water they will use butter and they will mix these things up and to straighten the hair straight mm -hmm. in order to style it and, and, and style it and braid it. So now on the plantation, they will use this resin stuff, this stuff that you actually put in the, the, uh, the lanterns to light the lanterns, you know, losing these dangerous things that they actually put in the hair to actually smooth it or straighten it where they can style it, com you know, style it completely. So, Braids was braids became synonymous with with um with slavery, right? And a lot of people have a misconception of that's where that style was created, but that also is a misnomer and a mistruth. Mm -hmm. Those styles go further back before we encounter uh a European in the 14th century or even in the 15th century. Um and even locks. Um you know, locks is a style that has been created when you look at the uh the Humber or the Himba people in two different locations, one in one in west, one in 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 in, in east. Those people had locks prior to um 
um, going into Jamaica. Not saying that the people in Jamaica is not African people. We know mm -hmm. our people spread it everywhere, um, especially doing uh, via the slave trade. We was dropped off in so many places, right? So, but a lot of uh, the styles resemble some, some uh, people say that that was a rebellious style and that style was created through rebellions, which is untrue, which it is a rebellion style because the locks, even the Afro, we know in the 60s and the 70s, the pick, when we talk about the comb, the, that pick became synonymous with rebellion, right? And they patent that. You know, they ended up taking it and, and, and patenting it, and we we bought it, we bought it like crazy. But that that and the Afro became a rebellion against the society, against, you know what I'm saying, the tremendous things that we go through in these countries, right? You know, the locks was the same thing, but locks was a style way before we even encountered and became. Now, when you get to Jamaica, it became rebellion, right? Yes. You know, it it it, it became a, a, a rebellion's uh, hairstyle at at um at, at that time. But the Hembra and the Hembra people, they use like 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 the Hembra people, even extensions. Let's say the extensions. Yes. I, I know I'm going. We think the hair is hair extensions is a new phenomenon too. But our ancestors would take cow hair and make extensions. And I show. I think it's on that in that article, and it's also in my book. I show other images of them actually taking the cow hair and making extension locks with it to make the hair longer. But also, you know, that was also a style when you would see they would use the extension to the back. That would also let you know that of the woman that I am ready to be married now. You know, oh, okay, okay. it would let you know that I'm ready. And the locks in the front, if we had a daughter and they would put the extension and lock the hair. The hair will be over the face. Even the braids, the braids will be covering the face. That will let you know that I am, I'm not a lady yet. I'm not a lady. I'm I'm I am still at I'm still an adolescent. I am not recognized by my community as uh as a um uh, as an adult. Okay. Yes. So they will use those. And then when you get to the Himbra, uh, Himba people, they had these small tiny locks that they would use, but they were uh, both of them would use water. Both yeah. of them will use butter. Butter and oil was used a lot when creating these different hairstyles. Palm oil is another one that was used a lot um, in there. So you will see these locks. And then later, it became a rebellion's hairstyle when we got to Jamaica. Uh, you know, a lot of Europeans would describe the styles. Like, a lot of people um, have a distaste for the word dreadlock. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a disdain for it. Because the word, it comes from dreadful. Those Europeans that, you know, when this style became popular as a rebellion style, right, they would say that, oh, these people, and, and another word that they would try to use derogatory, yes. dreadful, you know, and dreadful turned into the word dread, dread, uh, dreadlock, right? right? So, you know, that, so that was some of the things, I, you know, right there and that we used back then that we are still using now. Locks are popular braiding the hair is popular even high hairstyles you know yes. it's not a new phenomenon like you know I, even in an article i show you like some of the and i show a, a lot more in the book royal statuses people who have these royal statuses have these hair even going to locks now they have something now i don't know if it's popular over there but in florida most states in florida but it's getting popular here where i'm at but in florida there are something that they call wicks and these wicks are these big old thick locks. Mm -hmm. And these thick yes. locks. Yeah. Right. So if you look at uh the Ashanti, the Ashanti priest, back then the Ashanti priest had these big thick locks that the people wearing today they call wicks. They thinking this is something a new. Yeah. A lot of things that we do, we think this is a new phenomenon. We've been doing these things way back. So these wicks and these big matted locks, this is not or what they call freeform locks. Yes, we were doing these. We we we're by ancestors been doing these, these things. This is nothing new. You think you're creating something new when this is something old? So I show those things too. I think I show one priest, one in that article of in a priest. Yeah, which is, you know. So I wouldn't. But also with these matted locks or these or these thick locks that we're calling wicks. Also in certain cultures, it wouldn't be the priest wearing these. It would be the executor, yes. executionary. So I wouldn't know, okay, with well, this brother here, I ain't gonna play with this brother over here. 
this brother over here, yeah, you know, I'm not I'm gonna respect him over here. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play with him because he's an executor. These are things that he does. He he gets dirty. He gets dirty. So, but yeah, those are some of the things, you know, from here, you know, from there to to now that we are actually we're still we're still doing. No, no, thank you, because that's uh, that's good to know that uh, nothing that we're doing new is coming from a place that was already existing before. And mm -hmm. so, and as finally, as we as we close, what uh, final thoughts that you want to give to the listeners or the viewers, just to say in terms of with the N word for uh, for hair, but how to kind of embrace all of this and not look at it in terms of a negative lens? Well, you know, first I'll, I'll, I'll tell people, you know, um, be be grateful, be appreciative, you know, of who you are, you know, embrace your uh your hair, embrace your, your uh embrace your uh your, your, your skin tone, right? Our hair is grown uh in this in this certain type of way, which our, our hair has grown more than in this type of way because Africa does not only have what we consider uh tight coal hair, but we yes. have we have uh, curly and wavy hair. So I talk about 75% of African people on the continent or people, uh, 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 African descent people, 75% having um, coal or kinky hair, but 15% also having wavy and curly hair, which I mm -hmm. show though, when you go to the Ethiopian, if you look at Ethiopians and Somalias, but I just want to say, just embrace, um, embrace your hair, you know, um, my personal thing, stop using the N word because uh, even we have taken that word on. Um, if you have, I have no problem with it. Take it and embrace it in a in a, in a positive manner because now we got nappy whip, we got nappy curl, we got all types of beauty supplies that we took the word and flipped the word. Even if you flip the word, I appreciate it. I won't particularly use it in particularly, but I, I just say just appreciate who you are you know what I'm saying? Respect who you are, mm -hmm. um, you know, and 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 share with your friends and your family that you are beautiful no matter what, you know, no matter what color your skin tone is, no matter what, uh, no matter way your hair grow out your hair, your hair is the most important piece uh, on on your body. You know, also, you know, as um, far as respecting your hair, you know, Learn more about what your hair actually does, right? Learn more about it. You'll be able to appreciate it more, integrate it into your culture, because we all have certain cultural practices, you know, incorporate mm -hmm. uh, some type of uh, a practice of hair into your hair, you know, in, into your culture, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that may be just teaching um, your children, you know, okay, to uh, embrace the way that their hair uh, embrace the way that their hair grow, you know, show them things uh, um, um, of what our ancestors did um, 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 with their hair, uh, you know, show them that it's, it's a connection um, 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 to the divine, to the divine, right? So, yes. you know, again, and I, you know, and I, I'm rambling, but just embrace your hair, just embrace your hair, embrace who you are, respect who you are, um, and, you know, find out more about those different practices of uh, our ancestors did uh, ritualistic um, with their hair. No, thank you so much, Coffee. I really do appreciate it. I appreciate your time coming on and speaking about this, about your article. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe in the future, we'll be discussing your book in greater detail. But thank you. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please make sure to like, follow, subscribe, and write a review for the episode wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you.